It began in my third year at Juilliard where I studied acting. Uh, before I was at Juilliard, I was in the Marine Corps with 1-1 Weapons Company, 81's platoon out in Camp Pendleton, California. And when I got out of the military, I thought my transition from the military life to civilian life would be pretty simple. I was quick to learn that that was not the case. Putting words to feelings for the first time, I was making the human connection of being in the military through theater. And in doing so, I felt less alone. So we decided to create this project where we kind of introduce the military to the theater community and vice versa. And we're hoping to show that language is a powerful tool, that self-expression is a powerful tool. It's just as valuable as any rifle you carry or any tool you can put in your pack. So that's what we're trying to accomplish. So thank you so much for coming. I'll see you after. The first one we did, we tried to like reach out to different various organizations and veterans organizations, and everyone kind of felt that theater didn't fit a military demographic, that people basically wanted to see the San Diego Chargers cheerleaders. And I remember those events that we had that were like, you know, all well intended and, you know, great to have, but seemed like a little bit dumbed down considering what we were there to kind of do. I think it's cool to get the variety within the military in the same room together, because believe it or not, they don't all always have a way to interact or share an experience. So we're serving sort of all branches of the military, active duty, veteran, family members. No matter what your politics are, it's in our DNA that the cop on the corner, the fireman who goes into the building, the soldier who bears arms will stand in the line of fire for you. So we just come running. And Adam was in the armed forces, and you just come. It was right after September 11th. I was interested in acting, but I didn't want to go to school. And I moved at one point to California with like all my shit in my car. You know, because I heard all these stories of people like moving out to California with no money, like making it. I was there for two days, 48 hours, and I'd lost all my money. It was the disaster. So then I moved back, you know, and I had made a production about leaving Indiana. I was like, see ya guys. Like, you know, I'm heading out to... <laughs> heading west. Uh, heading west. I don't know when I'll be back. In 48 hours, I was back. And my stepdad was like, why don't you join the Marine Corps? And I was like, no, maybe. It was like December, and by February, I was gone. And they were like, are, are you on the run from the law? Because you, you're... You want to leave so fast. I just kind of made the decision and I'm like, I'm gonna do it. We did our first performance at Camp Pendleton and I remember like, you could tell people were listening and thinking and really making the connection of how we're presenting it, that it's no sets, no costumes, no lights, that it's all pared down. We're taking any pretense out of it and presenting something that could completely go wrong. I mean, that's what people in the military deal with on a day to day, is kind of improving and there's a structure and training in place, but then once you start doing it, like anything could happen. Does everybody want to rehearse? Who would like to read through? Peter, Jesse. I just want to get a sound check uh, more than anything else. Who was with us last time we went to Walter Reed? I don't think you okay. were. We did it in the Warrior Cafe, which is like their cafeteria. I keep on replaying our first one at Walter Reed and how much of a disaster that was. We had all these actors and like we showed up in the cafeteria and they're like, what are you guys doing here? And they're like, what do you mean, what are we doing here? We've been talking to you for months about like, should we come on the weekend or a weekday? And they're like, no, come on a weekend because everyone has time off. And then we show up and they're like, why are you here on a weekend? You should come during the weekday where everybody's here and everyone's gone home now. Joanne and one of our other board members at the time was running around to the different hospitals, pushing people with oxygen tanks to our performance. And then we managed to get like a small crowd in the cafeteria. So that was great. So then we wanted to come back even though they're clearly such a bureaucratic mess. Oh, look at this. Is this as bright as this goes? So this is all of the lights on in all of the house. This is as bright as it gets. All right, well then we can't really use this for anything if there's no lights on the stage. Hey, Joe. So this is the lighting situation. So we can either move everybody forward, and he says he's gonna try to get like some lights projected here somehow. Just to like do it in the audience, because here doesn't make any sense. We're at an event here, and there's lights. They said all of these lights are out. What does he mean when he says they're out? I don't know. I don't know what that means. I'm just gonna start pushing this here and see what happens. Hi. Yeah. Hey, I'm Adam. Clint. Hey, do you know how to turn these lights on? Yeah, I know how to turn them on, but they're all burnt out. They're burnt out? They are burnt out. There was a trouble put in on them Friday, and nothing's been done yet. 
Is there another kind of light that we can put on? There, there are no other lights up there. He went to go get something, right? He, said uh, he probably went down to the studio to bring some up. And then... Just bring some up to put in there? Well, either up there or down here on the floor somewhere. Put them on the thing. All right, great. A simple childlike question, one he'd been asked a thousand times, but Santa just gazed out blankly. Chuck Lurley said they donated a truckload of cigarettes to hand out to the Indians, or buy the album, because I remember for every dollar you donate fully, three cents goes directly to the Amazonian Indians. There's a total drum set back there. Are you serious? Yeah. Is there a way to get back into that space back there? Sure. You can the ca no, in the cage that, that's there? Into the cage? Yeah. I don't have a key. Okay. Yeah, can we use um, this? Let me see if, uh, They said there wasn't. Are they figuring out the lights? Ah! Oh, that helps. Shit, what is this, this fucking thing? Yeah. This is not blocked up. So this is for... This is for, we usually have like, um, for Batman, it's like very percussive. We have a drum with like a cymbal. It's the middle of the night and the sky is glowing like mad radioactive red. And if you squint, you can maybe see the moon through a thick layer of cigarette smoke and airplane exhaust that covers the whole city like a mosquito net that won't let the angels in. And if you look up high enough, you can see me standing on the edge of an 87-story building. And up there, a place for gargoyles and broken clock towers that have stayed still and dead for maybe like a hundred years. Up there is me. And I'm freaking Batman. That's when I heard it. This low growling behind me, like something ready to attack. And I turned around, and there was, there was Santa growling at me. So we're going to be raising the money up here in New York <laughs> and shipping it down. And it really changed their lives in a substantial way. And remember, for every dollar you donate, fully three cents goes directly to the Amazonian <laughs> Indians. <laughs> uh, the point is, husband and wife. Man and woman, Adam and Rib. Sometimes the man is stupid. Sometimes the woman is stupid. Sometimes both are stupid. The point is, man and wife are joined by holy matrimony to complete each other. I thought my marriage was dead, or, or I was dead, or both, and now somehow I've got him back again, and, and me, and my personal heart of hearts, I mean, I don't give a shit to judge the means, good or bad. It's funny, here I am, closer to my husband than I've, I've been in a long time, you know, a, a long, long time. But I feel free. And I started thinking that maybe this state of having nothing and feeling so used up, well, maybe that's sort of the state that God wants me in. You know, not so full of all my ideas about myself and what a rebel I am, but just, you know, sort of ready to listen. Then I heard the Packard coming up the hill. From a mile off, I could tell it was a Packard by the sound of the valves. The lifters have a sound like nothing else. And I could picture my dad driving it. My heart was pounding just for my dad coming back. And then I heard them pull the brake. Lights go off, keys turned off, then a long silence. Then I heard the door of the Packard open. Pop of metal, dogs barking down the road, door slams, feet. Heart pounding, sound of door not opening. For kicking door. Man's voice, dad's voice. Dad calling mom, no answer, foot kicking, foot kicking harder, wood splitting, man's voice in the night, foot kicking hard right through the door, one foot right through the door, bottle crashing, glass breaking, fist through the door, man cursing, man going insane, man yelling, shoulder smashing, whole body crashing, man throwing wood, man throwing up, mom calling for cops, dad crashing away, back down the driveway, car door slamming, ignition grinding, wheels screaming, packer disappearing, sound disappearing, no sound. Mom crying soft, and far off the freeway could be heard. Thank you so much.
so much. Well, I thank can't you so tell much you for and all your and all, every single member here was supremely outstanding. Oh. Keep using your gifts because they just take us out of our everyday world and you're just food for the soul. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you very you. much. You thank you. Out. Thank you so much for coming out. No, no, no. This is this yeah, great. Really appreciate yeah, you thank you. Great. Thank you so awesome. much for coming. Hey, man. I just wanted to thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, what unit were you with? 1-1, one, one, weapons company. When, what year? A, one, 2002, 2004. OK, I, w I was attached to 3-5 while I was over there. Oh, I sure. went to the initial invasion in 2003. I was attached to the first part of the entire time. Did you go over? No, them? no, no. Oh. Two months before I was supposed to deploy, it broke my sternum. So all my <laughs> friends went. And then I just got back to 3 1 when they just came back. So okay, I, yeah, all my friends went over and I went to acting school. <laughs> so it's, like, Fuck. It's, all, it's all the same, man. I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. Most of the people that came, that came back got out anyway. So yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of, a lot of them, especially yeah. during that time. I stuck around um, because I had a family and, oh, and right. things like that. Otherwise, I would have gotten out right afterwards. Yeah. But I really appreciate that you guys took the time to come out here and do hey, that. Man, thanks so much yes, for coming. I, I really appreciate it. It means a lot. I think civilians and military are isolated from each other and shouldn't be. That isolation, I think, is really bad, given that there's tremendous sacrifice and cost going on. I don't think war should be taken lightly. I think it's a serious, serious issue, and it is incumbent on all of us to be familiar with what the hell is going on. You know, most of us don't do jobs where we're going to get wounded or get killed. And I just think it's a lot to ask of people and then say, oh, and we're not going to think about you afterwards or we're not going to support you when you need to be hospitalized or you need aftercare or what is PTSD and all of that stuff that I think people should know about. I think part of the thing is when you look around this group, I mean, there's no career move being made here. Nobody's doing this because they think it's going to get them anywhere. They're doing it because they have heart. It says something about who the group is. I think people want to serve and they want to do something. People just don't know where to kind of put that energy, especially maybe in the entertainment industry. We're offering the value of the arts, and that's hard to quantify. How we're paying for this is through, you know, basically personal relationships that we started with people who are donating ten to the thousand dollars over the past eight years. We're still raising money for it and, and trying to do it in a way where I don't feel like we're selling our souls. We can come out here whenever you want before we start and we'll just maybe Joanne you can be in charge of kind of making sure there's room for um, people to get through. People there. to get through. If, the last thing that's gonna happen before we start is Fitz is gonna get on a god mic and say thank you to Actors' Equity for letting the people of my union work for no pay, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And at that point, then, the two of you are going to come through this little aisle that, that you guys have made and start the play here. Everybody ready to give this a bit of a whirl? Brilliant. Let's do it. All I ask for is the respect to handle my business in my neighborhood, with my people, at my own pace, in my own way. You couldn't even give me that. Where are you from? I don't know. Can I come? Get away. So are we still together? Scene four. Let's hold for one sec. Great, guys. Just keep continuing to make reminders about the stakes of this. This fight could be the fight that ends their whole relationship. We have to keep looking for that. Keep looking for how these fights are life and death in this play. Thanks. I mean, I don't know if there's a way that we can frame it and get, like, the, the adhesive stick tape or something like that. I don't know if that's too much of a production. But this seems to be, like, better. Yeah, I just feel like I need to be a little bit clearer about what it is, because it just looks like bid on all of it. We're doing a silent auction for the first time. I think that's a way we've reconciled, like a, a non seedy way of raising money. Joanne has been basically for the past three months going to different veterans organizations in the city and just, you know, showing up. Really, just by being there is like a big deal. So a lot of veterans organizations in New York are coming. People who have donated, civilians who have made a donation of $200 can come. And it's free for all veterans, current servicemen and women and their families. I feel like we have a little more control tonight as far as like the audience goes. But it's a little scary because it's also the first time we've ever just done a whole play reading. And we have one read through with all the actors to rehearse it. Our Lady of 121st Street by Stephen Adley Gerges. Where you live, Vic? Brooklyn? Queens? Staten Island. We'll have a squad car drive you home. 
The actors were so fucking good. That play is so good. And the people that came to it were so grateful and, and never heard that play before. And were like, we never seen theater before. It's too expensive. And thank you for not editing it or presenting something that was tame. I don't know why we're not doing more of this. It was really good. Rooftop enters, but Inez is gone. Vic and Balthazar sit silently. Edwin is still sleeping on the bench. Blackout. End of play. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Sorry about it. Awesome. I love your speech. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for coming. It really means a lot to me that you come. It's like the kind of thing where if there's one person in the audience, <laughs> At the beginning, you feel really nice. bad, but by the end, you're like, oh, I had an effect it's on nice that person, and so like everything else goes away. Nice. But we always want to serve a lot of people. It's amazing. The play was great. The actors were incredible. Yeah. Oh, they're good. I'm so glad you've got a chance to come. It's just a great thing you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And you're a playwright, right? Or I'm trying to. Yeah. That's wow. You have a great memory. Yeah. So it's. Um, so I turned into like the Lark Theater. It's in you know, a big group here, and then the, yeah. the Great Plains uh, playwriting contest. Those are the two I turned them into. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of proud of it. You know, it's like you should be. Congratulations! Stuff, so. It's a huge well, thank deal. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> well, just having you in the audience is really helpful. So well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's why we're doing it. You know. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah. I think it went well. People seem to really respond to the play. Right, Adam? Yeah. No, people seem to really respond to it. And there's a lot of veterans here, which is really uh, important, I think. Like the conversation that we're having at the end, actually, with those guys were, was really great. Uh, they were really fed up with uh, the veterans entertainment that they received up until that point and really saw what we were doing by picking that play and liked it. We kind of stayed away from making this like a veterans play that's something that you needed. It was more just a play that they took things from and they completely got it. Last year we went to Germany and that was like a big thing just to go overseas. But ever since we first started it, to go to the Middle East was what we originally intended to do. So it's literally taken us eight years to get our shit together to go. <laughs> well, I mean, not get our shit together to go, but to actually build up enough of credibility, I guess, to convince people that we weren't the enemy. Everyone's gonna talk to you in military time tomorrow. After the show is a meet and greet. Sometimes a ton of people want to talk, sometimes fewer people want to talk. Sometimes one person will talk to you for 45 minutes. You know what I mean? You guys do what's comfortable. Now, is there anything sort of um, heated happening? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, obviously, we know about this bombing in the mosque the other day. I mean, even if there was, I don't think that they would say anything about it. So I, I would just be mindful of it. But we don't know. We right, have not yeah. been told. Yeah, and I don't think the... they will. I don't think they would, like, oh, kind of tell us, volunteer that information. Uh, yeah. But I think well, that people would that, like, <laughs> sexual assault is a big issue. Oh, really? Like we had an issue yes, with yes, uh, censorship, yes. but we're trying to kind of like not skim over it, but we've submitted everything and it was approved, so we're not going to do anything different Can from you, what um, the script is. expand on that a little bit, please? You know, it's been a big problem in the past few years, sexual assault, in the military community. So they read the script and their first reaction is, you can't do this because there's sexual references. You're not even supposed to reference anything having to do with sex according to some people in the military. A week before we were supposed to go to Germany, suddenly the command wanted to see the material. And we had already like booked the travel, had planned 14 actors, I think, to go. And a couple days before, they got a call and said, you have to edit it or you're not going to perform. So we did it once in Germany where we cut out all references to sex, and we did it. And people seemed to like the performance. But for us, it felt like we compromised on something. And so we kind of made a vow that we would never do it again. Either we do the whole performance and people you know, have their reaction to it, or, or we just don't do it. I fired an M16. I went to an Israeli army training program as a youth. As a youth? Like, how long were you there? I was there, like, you know, it was a summer camp thing when I was about 13, but I got kicked out. Kicked out of the training camp? Yeah. Why did you get kicked out of the training camp? Um, I organized, like, I was really into missions, so I organized, like, a mission where all the girls snuck into Jerusalem and went partying. You were... So you got caught? Yeah. If you guys have any questions about anything you see, or even in general about Kuwait, just let me know if anything seems out of place to you. 
let me know. You might see something I don't see on the road. Just let me know, and then I'll uh, or let you know and answer. Exactly. Are you going to be giving us a security briefing, or is that? So as far as security briefing, of course, you know, Kuwait, there's a lot of actually hidden terrorist cells everywhere throughout the country, but uh, they hadn't been acting until recently. So, uh, I mean, you can close your shades if you want. When they look in, if they see Westerners, you know, okay. they like to stare as well. The main concern here is actually just traffic. Uh, per capita, this is like one of the worst places to drive because, I mean, inshallah, they just do whatever they want. Traffic there is crazy in Kuwait. People like drive in, like 150 miles an hour, drive on the medians, and like it's very desolate and like that beige desert, not like you know Arizona desert or something like that. It's just plastic bags caught in like barbed wire on the side of the roads. So, uh, it's a very strange place. Hi, I'm Natasha. Pleasure, John Bestall. Hi, Joanne. Nice yeah. to meet you. Hello, Adam. John Bestall. Hi, nice to meet you. you. Welcome to our our little dirt field. Yeah. Let's get you inside where the AC is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The launch tool, yeah. How are you? Go ahead. Well, good to see you again. Thank you enough for, oh, for having us. It really means a lot to us and that you were so willing to, to host us. You have no idea what this means. Well, you probably do. A lot of them have no idea what it means to yeah. the guys to see this. Are you, can you make it tonight? Or are you yeah, going? I'm planning oh, okay, on great. I'm going to send the star major to talent night. And I'm oh, great, great. <laughs> All right, cool. All right. Thank you very much. Hey, I appreciate it. You. All right, you too. See you. This company exists for two reasons here in Kuwait. First, provide force protection to U.S. interests, like I said earlier, for the state of Kuwait and two, to build partnership capacity with the Kuwaiti government and the Kuwaiti military. It builds a relationship, number one, uh, because in this part of the world, relationships matter. So if something bad happens, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, this company then transitions from a force protection force to a war fighting force, and we get all of our neat toys, put them in containers, and we go forward to where, where the fight is to make sure that the, the U.S. forces are safe. So, yes. Where's the women in this unit, or is that just a so, coincidence? Good question. So yes, EOD is, is not gender specific. It's not a combat arms MOS. If you were to look across the board at our stats, at our metrics, women make a very small percentage of our force. My unit currently has five females, two of which are here, but one is my HR, my human resource sergeant, and one is my supply. So my only female EOD tech that I'm currently assigned, she's in the rear uh, because she's actually getting out of the military. She's separate. Mm. Why do you think that is? Uh, you know, I don't know. It's a good question. Not a lot of people know what this job comprises based on what you see in television and what you see in the movies. You look at the percentages across the military of you know male to female makeup, you already have an offset as far as the percentage. And then you look at specialty MOSs like this, where you know advertising and, and word of mouth isn't really there. So that, that's the best I can probably say on that. Yeah. Anything else? Do you guys want to touch stuff? Yes. All right, get after it. Hey guys, come up and, and walk through. So your shoulders are going there, your back towards me. All right, squat down for me. <laughs> this comes down. There you go. Go get it. Please, take it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 I told you you didn't need that. I told you you didn't need that. And he's up. <laughs> he's going. 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 Are you coming to the thing or the thing no, tonight? I didn't know about it. Oh, you didn't? Tonight at uh, 1900 in the chapel. Should be should be good. Should be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hopefully you'll hopefully you'll come. Do you need one? Yeah, I'll take one. Thank That's you. Right, yeah. No problem. I hope to see you tonight. If you don't mind, I just want to leave one of these here. We're doing a, a theater performance tonight at 1900 in the chapel. So you're more than welcome to come. It'd be great to have you. Nice to meet you. Are you going to come tonight? Yes, I am. All right, cool. And how big a group is it that you work with? Out here, uh, very large. Nobody's watching. No. Anything at all personal, deeply personal that you want to share now, <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> Plays for the show tonight, 7 o'clock? All right. Sorry to interrupt. We're, I'll leave a couple flyers. We're doing a theater performance tonight, 1900 in the chapel. So it's for free. It'd be great to have you. What's the secret? Uh, well, man, I can't say anything. Uh, I wish I could. I wish I could. Better than the prequels, right? 
it's going to be better than the prequel. Oh, yeah. Uh, fuck yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, this will be stage only. Oh yeah, no, I think it's too dark. Okay, we can. Okay. That's that. good. That's good. Don't you think? Yeah, that's better. Yeah. So guys, we're gonna rehearse if we could. Can... All right, go ahead. Whenever you're ready. Being annoying was not a capital crime last time I checked. Yeah, well, it should be. Yeah, that's right, corny ass scrub. Scrub. Everybody, stop the bullshit. That man said we had till dawn to decide who's going in. Look I, out the window. I, hold on it's, one second. Can we just go back and just make it really clear? Are we too loud? Oh, no, too no. much screaming? No, no, no. no. It needs idea. to be louder. These characters are not subtle people, right? Yeah. And the scene starts in the middle of, in the peak of the argument, right. right? It goes from the peak of the argument to a vulnerable place by the end. But I think we cannot underestimate where they are at the beginning. It's like, and you're all like, Charging really volume. committed to it. It's an argument and you are yeah. so committed to your arguments I think go farther than you think and then we can pull it back, but don't worry about volume and don't worry about yelling Can I, can I stay here for a couple more seconds? Mm -hmm. Sorry, if we turn the air conditioner off, how long do we have before it gets before it gets really hot? You can't Why what do you mean? Because if you go back here, it's really hard to hear them because yeah. of the air conditioner. So maybe, how many mics do you have? I only have three of these. Okay, well then, then could we use three of these and then one? So I can put you wired mics. I can yeah. put four mics up. That'd be amazing. Oh, four wired, you got four of these. I'll put two of these and two wired. Oh, that'd be amazing. Two. And so you'll have oh, four Oh, this mics. isn't, this isn't wired. This is wireless. Yeah, of course. Right. It's a great experience to perform for an audience that could not be more generous and receptive and responsive. They're coming at these plays with such fresh eyes and ears and the, the response you couldn't ask for a better audience. It's so diverse and uh, grateful and interested and makes theater that much more effective when you feel like people are really listening. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Adam Driver, and on behalf of Arts and the Armed Forces and our actors, it really means a lot that you are here, so I guess we should clap. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Arts and the Armed Forces, this, started in 2006 in my second year uh, in college at the Juilliard School in New York City. And prior to Juilliard, I was in the Marine Corps with <laughs> one, one weapons company. There's one. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> I'll get my ass kicked after this. Hoorah. My transition from military to civilian life was very, well, a bit complex. Gradually, however, at school, I was exposed to playwrights and characters and plays that had nothing to do with the military, but were somehow articulating my military experience in a way that before to me was indescribable. And I felt myself becoming less aggressive as I was able to put words to feelings for the first time and realizing what a valuable tool that was. And what better community to arm with a, a, the tool of self-expression than those protecting our country. So again, thank you for having us. Please, after the performance, if you want to come up and say hi, we're not going anywhere, we're stuck here. <laughs> uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks again, appreciate it. If you ask me, Paul should be the one to die. Why me? Cause you're fucking tired and annoying. Everybody stop the bullshit. The man said we had till dawn to decide who's going and look out the window. It's almost dawn. Paul, can I share something with you? I guess. I'm getting kinky thoughts. What kind of kinky thoughts? Kinky ones. I'm thinking about you being real heroic and volunteering to be the one who dies. Would you like to volunteer? <laughs> Why would I volunteer? Because if you volunteer, I'll blow you. Blow me? Yo, take my advice, it's worth it. Flock out. <laughs> Husband and wife, man and woman, Adam and Rib. I don't want to dwell on the inequality of the sexes because hey, these vary from couple to couple. Sometimes the man is stupid, sometimes the woman is stupid, sometimes they're both stupid. The point is man and wife are joined in holy matrimony to complete each other, to populate the earth and to glorify God. 
I had my own hypothesis about the world, which is basically whatever the fuck happens, happens, and we'll probably never know why. Well, then I got pregnant with Abby when I was in high school, and that was pretty much the last straw for my parents. And somehow I ended up with this little scrap of a life, this little nothing thing. You, know, you could just vacuum it up with a dustbuster and it'd be gone. I mean, I've got, I've got nothing for it. I've really got nothing. No stuff, no money, no ideas, no plans. I continued to watch and have come with no little excitement to understand that baseball is a perfect metaphor for hope in a democratic society. First is a home run trot. The home run trot, not the mad dash around the bases when it's an inside the ballpark home run. I've never seen an inside the ballpark home run. I'm talking about the graceful little canter when the ball has been crushed and it's missing and the outcome's not in doubt. And what I like about it is that it's so unnecessary. The ball's gone. No one's gonna bring it back. Play is suspended for a celebration. And I like this, I like this because I don't believe in God. Well, I don't know about God or uh, about any of that metaphysical murk. Yet I like to believe that there's something about being human is good. And I think what's best about us is manifested in our desire to show respect for one another, for what we can be. And well, that's what we do in our ceremonies, isn't it? We honor ourselves as we pass through time. And it seems to me that to conduct this ceremony, not before the game or after the game, but in the very heart of the game. Does any other game do that? That's baseball. Hey, thanks a lot for coming. I appreciate it. Yeah, this no problem. Great. Good change of pace for us. Oh, I'm glad. Thank, thank you very you. much for what you're doing. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you so much. Hey, no problem, man. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Hey, man. have a good one. Great to meet you, man. A lot of people came up and were saying that it was just so different than what it usually comes here in a good way. It was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Made me smile, made me cry a little bit, you know. It was great. You guys are doing this right in the sense of not so much talking about it, but doing it, giving people the experience. That's great to hear, and that's definitely the goal. You just get the sense that people want to talk and they want to tell their story. A lot of the conversations I had were just, what do you do? What's your job? It's really nice to have something like this. We've been um, locked down a post because of um, the mosque bombing that happened a couple months ago. So mm -hmm. they've been there about letting us off. So it's really nice to actually have something to look forward to. Yeah. Because it gets a little monotonous. I felt like a real urge to want to communicate and just a real gratitude that we were here. One thing we've always been talking about from the beginning of our project is what's the risk of going to meeting people on the front lines? Why is it actually necessary? And, it, and does it actually cause more of a disruption than it, than it heals anything? And, and I can't help but think that even in the most stressful circumstances, offering a new means of self-expression or showing characters that I feel will resonate with that audience or just giving a, a vocabulary to that audience through these really human characters that we're representing, no time in anyone's life is that bad. You can't place a value on the arts, and that's a hard thing to convey. That's, you know, whatever we're offering, you may not initially see the benefit from, but just planting that seed of a character that we can all relate to maybe have benefits down the road.